Welcome to the Pre-Health Pod. My name is Lexi. And I'm Sarah. And we're a podcast by students for students who've been through undergrad, are going through application processes, and are here to meet you wherever you are. Welcome back to the podcast. It's always awesome to talk to you, my brunch girlfriend, Sarah. Yes. (laughs) I'm happy to be here again. How are you? How's everything? Good. I love talking to our guest speaker, which we'll get to in a little bit, um, Tyra Lee Brett. She is truly remarkable and is doing some awesome research helping students and advocating for students, especially underrepresented students and you know the disadvantages they experience with applying to medical school and really just raising awareness of that and hopefully lead to more advocacy down the line and change all of that. So really great conversation. Awesome person. So stay tuned for that. But yes. And if you're looking for a research opportunity that's not bench work, honestly, she has one for you. And she talked Ooh. about it in this episode. So stay tuned. We're trying to hook you up some with some opportunities, no matter where you are in the country right now. Research experience. <laughs> yes. Okay. But the bigger question that I have for you is how the hell did your interview <laughs> go last week? I have been I, waiting to hear. I think it went well. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, ho- I hope it went well. I had a great time, actually. It probably sounds so weird, but like halfway through, I was kind of enjoying myself. <laughs> it's like, Ooh. I to talk about myself. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, stop. Why is she a podcaster? <laughs> Why did she create a podcast, guys? Does anyone know? Anyone? Any ideas? Anywhere? <laughs> Everyone probably thinks I'm so selfish. This is not No, good. that's so <laughs> funny. Okay, okay, okay. So tell me a little bit about how your interview went. Like, how did they end up structuring that? Yeah, so there, the entire interview day was about four hours, like 11 to 3 on a Friday. And it was all virtual. So my butt was really hurting by the end of it. <laughs> how staying strong. I positioned myself in front of this like blank wall and hung a little picture in the background because cute. So it looked look a little nicer. No um, Zoom backgrounds. <laughs> yeah, I actually use this podcast microphone, and my interviewer was like, "What is that?" I was like, "Oh, it's my it's my podcast microphone. It's a little fancy. I don't know. <laughs> Just from my podcast yeah. that I record." <laughs> so yeah, the way the interview was structured <laughs> is at the beginning. We had a presentation where they explained how the interview format would go and how the day would go as well and some of the schedule. And then they allowed us all to introduce ourselves and share a fun fact. My fun fact was this podcast, (laughs) you guys. Wait, wait, wait. Were you in like a group with all of the interviewees? Yeah, it was a regular Zoom meeting. And there were like a few dozen people, I think. And they had us go around the room and introduce ourselves, our name, and a fun fact of, about us. Yeah. Where we were from. So yeah, I said the podcast. So gotta spread the word, guys. <laughs> okay. Well, if any of you are listening because you were in Lexi's interview group, we God. hope your interview <laughs> went well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, the rest of the format, we transitioned to the MMI, which was about six different breakout rooms. So everybody got sent like a different Zoom link. So I got to stay in the home Zoom link that we had the presentation in. And there was a moderate in there with like six different interviewers. Every 10 minutes, they would have us like switch into a different breakout room. And there were six breakout rooms that we did until the end of the interview. And it took about one hour for the MMI to take place, which is students for multiple mini interview. Yeah. And some of the interviewers were medical students and some professors. I think that's right. (laughs) Based on what I was asking them. I can't obviously share the questions, but there was one question that they asked at all the medical schools and they shared this as well was, why do you want to become a physician? Some other questions that they asked were ethical scenario based. It was a closed file interview. So they didn't know anything about my application, any of my stats, my MCAT score, my GPA, my experiences. I was just a fresh face. I think all they knew was just what my name was. And so I really had to advocate for myself and draw from examples and draw from my experiences. But I did kind of have fun with it. I think the one drawback though is each little interview was around, like I had um about seven minutes in each room 
And I wish I had more time because by the end yeah. of it, me and the interviewer started engaging in conversation. Like my podcast microphone, I wanted to ask questions about that. I wanted to share a little bit more about that and my nonprofit. And also I wanted to ask them some more questions about their experiences, especially their research yeah. experience and how to get that. And that's something I think is the drawback of the MMI. You kind of miss out on that one-on-one conversation. But I think it's also really benefited me because if you don't really connect with one of the interviewers, that's okay because the next interviewer doesn't know what happened in the previous room and you just start fresh. I think I had a lot of difficulty answering one of the questions, but then I had to tell myself like, that's okay, leave it in the room. Let's go to the next one and just move on. That's something I really liked about the MMIs. And then after that, they gave a thorough presentation about UVA Tucson, which is where I interviewed and their programs, opportunities to engage in community service and engagement. It was really awesome. I love learning about the program. And they also had an opportunity to do a Q&A with medical students and ask them a little bit more questions. But this wasn't one-on-one. It was with the entire medical or the entire pre-medical students who were interviewing that day. But you get to ask general questions about the program and their experience. And then it ended. And that was pretty much it. Wow. That's awesome. I love the perspective that you shared the MMIs and leaving that one negative moment in that interview and moving on to the next. Cause yeah. it really is like that's a completely different person you get to talk to now. You don't have to bring that into the next room. Yeah. Yeah. I actually had a great experience. I was really shocked how much I enjoyed the MMI. So I think I definitely prefer it over just one traditional interview because yeah. You know, if the vibes aren't there, it kind of just like sets off the mood for the rest of the interview. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is there anything that you wish you had done to prepare before your interview that you didn't do? Like anything you regret? I honestly have a lot of research on the school. So I wouldn't say that. That's a big piece of advice. Make sure you research the school. Yeah. I think I wish I did a little bit more self-reflection, if anything. And maybe focused a little bit less on the ethical scenarios because they actually didn't ask as many as I thought they were going to and reflect a little bit more on questions regarding burnout or how to handle a big workload in medical school and how I value community and really think back to my experiences and self-reflect on that. So I think that's probably my biggest piece of advice. I honestly think I over-prepared. (laughs) because <laughs> I I just did so many questions and I had to really kind of throw out that mindset out the window because I didn't want to sound like a robot before or... my interview. So I was like, what am I doing? I can't write bullet pointed answers to all these questions I'm finding on the internet. I really need to try to keep it natural and try to just have that conversation, which I really tried to do during the MMI, even though it's meant to be objective. So yeah, any piece of advice I give you guys, take the opportunity of those golden minutes at the end of your MMI, your individual interview with each of the interviewers to try to ask them a question and engage with them and learn a little bit more about them as well to establish that connection. Absolutely. I love that. And I know I probably shouldn't be sponsoring someone else's thing. We're not getting paid for advertising this book I'm about to tell everyone about. (laughs) But honestly, it's a great resource and it's provided me a lot of comfort in preparing for my upcoming interview. So if I can provide someone else with that just by letting them know it exists, great. Here you go. This book was made to prepare for PA school interviews. But after hearing how Lexi prepared for her interviews... Honestly, I think this book applies just as much to medical school as it does to PA school. It really helps you realize the why behind the questions they're asking. Just so I would highly recommend it. It's called the Physicians Physician Assistant School Interview Guide, Tips, Tricks, and Techniques. And it's written by Savannah Perry, who's from the PA platform. So not to advertise her, but I do love her. Yeah, she spoke at our conference, so love her. (laughs) Not sponsored, but would highly recommend reading this book. And it's only $10, so totally a good investment to make. 
I'm really excited for you. What is the plan now? When did they tell you when you'd hear back? Yeah, they gave us a timeline. They said mid-October is when acceptances would start rolling out. And it could go for a few months after that. So it's just the waiting game now for that school. And I'm still waiting on all the other schools I applied to. But I'm pretty sure it's still early in this cycle. I guess it's September 1st now. So I don't know. We shall see how it goes. I'll update you guys. (laughs) That's exciting. Yeah. Well, I have an update for everyone. It's not a fun one, but don't freak out, Lexi. It's okay. I'm not upset. I received my second rejection from a PA school. Yes, I know. So this was a school in Florida that I had applied to. Um, Honestly, it's a really small class size. And in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have bothered being, I'm still considered an out-of-state student for Florida because I just moved here. So I probably shouldn't have even bothered applying to this school. But I did because it's a great program. And I got the rejection today right after the gym. And let me tell you, if you're going to get rejected from PA school, a great time to read that email is after the gym because it barely (laughs) even affected me. I was like high on all of that adrenaline and endorphins. And I was just feeling so good that when I read it, I was like, oh, okay, sounds good. But I will say having an interview coming up so soon, I think that's given me a lot of perspective to handle this with too. Like, yeah, it's not like all my eggs were in that basket. There's other opportunities still, but I just wanted to share that with you all. I don't know. I think it's awesome that you're being transparent about it. Transparent. That's the word I was looking for. (laughs) I I mean, being transparent, I think listening to other people be transparent is really helpful for me. So yeah, I hope it helps other people too. And honestly, it's kind of hard to find when I was feeling really down about one of my classes I was taking, I like seriously TikTok search GPA. Like someone tell me that it's going to be okay. No one's going to admit online that they have a bad GPA or that they got a bad grade in a class. So I'll keep doing it for (laughs) y'all. Well, Sarah, I mean, you're just so personable, dependable, kind, reliable, a great team leader. You have all the aspects of a fantastic physician assistant. And I have no doubt that you will get into a program who will be very lucky to have you to be our next PA leader in this country. So it's their loss. (laughs) And some (laughs) other PA program will absolutely love to have you. So, and they, plus they can have our pod, just kidding. They can be on our podcast, not have. (laughs) You can't have it, but you could guest star in our podcast. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) Oh, that's hilarious. No, Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's something that I've been thinking about a lot too, is how I want to establish myself in the next school I go to. Because I think at ASU, the first few years, and honestly, I'll just admit all of the years, I was a little bit of a fly on the wall. I liked to join clubs and opportunities and stuff, but I didn't try to lead them. I didn't try to take any position where I could influence change. National pre-health community was really the position that kind of broke me out of my shell a little bit and made me realize that I can make a difference in this little world we've created. Yeah. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about that, how I'm going to continue to influence change when I go to PA school and what I want to do at that school. So I would definitely, if you're preparing for interviews, think about that too. What are you bringing to the table for their school? What do you want to change about their program? There is not a perfect program. So I don't think it's bad to say, I'd like to change this thing about your program by implementing this. Mm. So I don't know. Food for thought. Yeah. I wrote in my secondaries. I wanted to start a chapter of MPHC, or I just I want to start a new club. I want to fix this at my local university and I love your help, you know? Yeah. And I think this episode is the perfect one to listen to if you're interested in advocacy and making change, because Tyra Lee Brett is definitely the person to talk to about that. She is remarkable, truly doing the good advocacy work for pre-medical students in the U.S. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. With that, we hope you enjoy this episode and you love what she says as much as we did. And yeah, we'll transition there. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Pre-Health Pod. We have our special guest here, Tyra Lee Brett. She's an immigrant from Johannesburg, South Africa, and she's a biomedical sciences major that attends the University of South Florida. 
Tyra's passion is serving the underserved and creating long-lasting impact. She's volunteering at the Tampa VA and did an undergraduate research job. And Tyra is the pre-medical trustee for the American Medical Student Association as well. She's combined her love for research and advocacy to design projects to enhance the access to pre-medical resources for underprivileged students, which we absolutely love and align with. (laughs) She loves all things sport as she is a Japanese recognized black belt in karate and has represented South Africa at two world championships. She's more accomplished than I've ever been. (laughs) And she's also the founder of an online personal training company. Please welcome Tyra. Hey, how's it going? Hi, everyone. Uh, Going really well back into the semester, so feeling good. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. It's awesome to be here. Yeah, I'd love to jump in to our first question and ask a little bit more about that research you are interested in doing. Tell us about your research and what are your short-term and long-term goals for this research? Yeah, so basically it is a Google survey that is evaluating the barriers of access that students have when applying to medicine. We all complain about it every day, right? We all know what the barriers are, but there's no literature out there that's actually showing why 50% of students don't get into medical school each year. So our long-term goal, I think short-term goal a lot is working on where can we advance our students? Where can we help students grow in the actual application cycle themselves? Where are their gaps in the system? Where do students need more resources and opportunities? So short-term goal was just really figuring out what we could start doing locally and in our own communities to impact how our students are getting opportunities for the medical school application. And long-term goal We've got some pretty big and exciting ones. We want to start shadowing programs and research opportunities for underrepresented kids. We want to connect community colleges with medical schools so that they're getting the right training from early on in their pre-med career. We're really hoping to make long-lasting, impactful projects across the country that are helping underrepresented students keep up with majority students when it comes to applying to medical school. That is awesome. I am curious, though, you threw around the word kids a lot. So now I'm wondering what your age group is you're looking at, because I know I'll say like kids, even about my age. So I'm just curious, like, are we looking <laughs> high school, college, elementary? Yes. How how low are we going here? Yeah, I think that's just the South African in me. But no, we, <laughs> we're talking college kids right now. There has been discussions yeah. about doing something on a high school level, but we are, we're waiting to be a little bit more settled in the college one. So right now it's everyone from freshmen to seniors in the college age group. Oh, that's fantastic. And are you sending out the survey like to pre-health offices nationally or how is that work? So it's all student led. It's all student driven. So basically through connections and meeting people, we're getting students from other campuses to actually have their own little center, right? Their own little research project where they oh, are great getting an advisor, filling out an IRB, and sending out the survey on their campus. And then we're joining all the the, the research data. So it's all student-driven and getting involved in it can be anyone across the country. Oh my gosh. I'm sure there's an honor student in my college who would love that as a thesis project. (laughs) Yeah. For our listeners, how do they get involved with this research project? Yeah. So it's super simple, super easy. The whole project's done for you. Normally, just through emailing me, there is on the AMSA, the American Medical Student Association, there is a form to fill out an interest form there that I can give you guys the contact information for in my email. And basically, all the student has to do is be a pre-med passionate about making change and get an advisor or a professor on board to want to run the survey. And then there's a couple of different options I can discuss with the students about how far they want to take this. But it's a really simple process. We're right now just looking for passionate kids. That's awesome. Thanks. (laughs) No. (laughs) Okay. So once you do this research and you figure out like which pipelines are causing issues, where the problem really is, do you have like a next step plan? Is this something that you're going to stay on top of and personally try to fix? Or is this something that you're just starting the process? Yeah. So I think when we first saw the project two years ago, it was just trying to figure out where we could help. And last year we were very awesomely able to do a lot. So we did seven initiatives across the country, everything from starting a shadowing program at a hospital near a community college 
specifically for underrepresented students. So that is a structured program that a community college has never had. In Tennessee, we had advisors actually block out certain timeframes for their AMSA students and students that fell into categories that needed help. So across the country, we've done three posters. We're looking at publications. So we're really the goal is to implement some kind of diversity initiative that's going to fix whatever the problem is. So if no one understands the MCAT, for example, having some Thing where one of the prep companies come in and do an MCAT workshop in a sense, right? So we've been trying to follow up the research with some kind of project that's going to make a difference. Long term, hopefully we can be implementing really big initiatives and structured programs for students. Yeah, I really hope so. Would you ever partner with the AAMC and get them in on this? I mean, I, of course, yes. I think I did the research and I think I needed there was something like to get like 1% of the AAMC's kind of market was wow. needing about like 6,000 students or something to do it. Wow. So I guess it just has to become big enough, but 100%, like we're trying to get this out there enough. This is all student-led, student-driven. Like we yeah. just need the universities to empower us to do the work, right? We're not asking for them. None of these things have been funded. None of them have needed money. These are all just students who are passionately doing stuff. So as long as the institutions are empowering us, we will do this for ourselves. Are you How early on in the process are you? And is there anything that has like, shocked you so far? Yeah. So we have now run it once just at a local community college. It was the first year. And the second year we ran it across eight institutions across the country, over 500 students. So we had a really nice cohort to do a poster presentation on at the Future Physicians for Change. And one of the biggest things I think that shocked me was when you compare majority students, senior students, which are about to graduate, and minority students in regarding the information that they have about the application cycle, they're pretty on par. Okay. Take a step back to the opportunities and experiences they've been able to get, such as shadowing, clinical volunteering, research, all of that. There's yeah. about a good 20 to 30% difference oh, wow. in majority and minority students. So schools are doing a great job of getting that information out there and students have access to the internet and podcasts and all of that, where they're hearing what they need but now there's a barrier to entrance for the actual activity, right? So I think that was one of the most shocking things that these students aren't just naive about it. They know they need it, Mm -hmm. but they really are struggling to get it. Yeah. I mean, that was a big thing at my university and I I want to get involved in this. This sounds great because my university, Sarah and I went to the same one, our pre-health advisors. Yeah. They just gave us information, but sometimes it was outdated and sometimes most of the time all of the time and the information wouldn't help us get any opportunities and when i asked them where we could find opportunities it was always just blanket statements and no links or guidance really and i've had some students as well share similar experiences and something i think i'm not sure how to fix this is is it something where I have to start at the university level at one university and pop over to the, to the next? Or can we like cast a wide blanket and send out like a broadcast and to all pre health advisors or their supervisors or whatever and be like, guys, we really need to fix this for these pre med students? Yeah, I think, you know, like in terms of changing anything in medicine, I think this right now is grassroots, right? We're going from the bottom to the top. The professors and advisors that have worked with us on this project, some of them are chemistry teachers. Some of them that the students have got involved are just faculty members who are really passionate about helping their students. I feel like we are slowly carving away at that. I've gone to advisors conferences. I've spoken about this kind of stuff. And I do want to give them some leeway as They're just overworked in very underfunded departments, right? So it is difficult for them. So that's why it was never about, oh, let's make the advisors do it. That's why it was about, hey, this is a student's job. Like if you guys want to fight for your future, this is what we're going to have to do together. That's kind of how we had it. And we've had a good amount of advisors have really positive feedback, which has been nice. So hopefully just with continued efforts and projects that are led, 
we can hopefully influence the right people to have that kind of trickle down. I know at my community college, when we started, our deans were very open to hearing the ideas. They said a yes to a lot of my crazy, crazy ideas. And that's all we needed, right? We got someone trained at the community college in pre-health advising, Mm -hmm. right? So it was stuff like that where you just have to make enough noise and hope the right people hear and want to help you. That is really inspiring. That's amazing. And I'd love to learn a little bit more about your just educational history. So you're a current undergrad at USF. Were you always pre-med? Or uh, Yeah. So I immigrated to the States just after I graduated high school. And I kind of awesome. had this idea in my head that I wanted to go into medicine. I didn't know what that looked like in this country. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when I got here, it was quite a shock. But when I got here, financially, I was not able to go to a four-year institution straight away. So I started at Hillsborough Community College for two years, awesome. where I met an advisor, a chemistry professor, who was just really passionate about helping students in the pre-health world. And I just kind of caught the bug from her, I think, even more to really want to pursue this. And ever since, I've been the pre-med. <laughs> <laughs> the pre-med. I love that. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that's a fantastic story. And yeah, thank you for everything you're doing for pre-medical students. And I very much align with your mission as the same way software college. I was like, I don't know how to do anything. The information is lacking or wrong and I don't know where to find this. So I started my own organization to find the information. (laughs) So I definitely agree with you in that way. And yeah, listeners get involved and We'll share contact information at the end of the episode. So you have to listen to the end. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask my next question. If there was one thing you would change about the pre-med process, whether application or in general, what would it be? Yeah, I think that's a really difficult one because I've taken a lot of time to invest myself in understanding why the program or the application program is structured the way it is and there are valid points and reasons and I completely understand why they ask the things that they do of us but in the same time I think one of the biggest things I would change is some of the financial burden that comes with pursuing medicine that comes with applying to medical school it it can be a really scary thing especially with secondary fees and interview fees and flying across the country so I think that's the biggest one but I overall think that if we could do a better job at undergraduate institutions preparing their students for the application or for medical school we could take some of that burden off of the students and make the process a little bit easier yeah Oh, yeah, I 100% agree with that. The financial burden is just the biggest part of it. I didn't really know that I had to pay so much for secondaries and it ended up costing me over two grand. All of the secondary essays that I wrote, I applied to 23 schools, as you all know. (laughs) We talk about this a lot. Um, And that was on top of the primary application as well. So if there's any advice I could give, just be prepared for that early on in college if you need to save up because it, it is a lot of money. And I mean, I have so many expenses on top of that. I've got to pay for rent and actually live a life outside of because I'm not at school anymore. I don't have loans or anything to cover that. So yeah, we really do need to decrease the financial burden for medical school applications and PA school applications too, Sarah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll admit it's not as bad as medical school, but it's still not great. So if we could work on that, (laughs) that would be great. But I'm kind of wondering, we've talked a lot about the shortcomings of (laughs) basically all United States universities' ability to prepare undergrads for grad programs. So I'd love Mm -hmm. if we could talk about what these freshmen can do now. I feel like we've thrown a lot of negativity in the air and I want to reassure them and tell them like, it's going to be okay. Here's what you need to start doing now. So what do you think (laughs) like going into freshman year, the best way students can prepare themselves is? Oh, hundred percent. Get involved in organizations and clubs and get engaged with professors and advisors. People are your biggest tool. I think, I mean, yeah, it's one thing to be yeah. reading books and the listening to the podcast and that, which is all great. I mean, these are, this is how you learn, but I think just getting engaged and you go to one club meeting and you might meet a doctor that's the guest speaker and you yeah. might end up getting shadowing or you might 
go and do a volunteer job at a hospital and end up getting a research project from it, right? It's all about opening yourself up to new opportunities and really trying to have the passion to ask questions and get involved. And I think it's doable, right? So many students have done it for years, right? People are getting into med school. And I just think that sometimes we need to hear this. It's like, hey, just go out there and ask questions. I didn't know what research I needed, right? So I asked a doctor at a hospital, like just be out there asking questions and trying to figure it out. And I think as long as you're passionate enough, things will come, right? Things will fall into place somehow. And I think a big thing is just, taking control of your own circumstance I didn't know anyone I had no connections and I immigrated to this country so yeah. it was like oh ask a doctor to shadow so I asked my dentist if he knew <laughs> someone and his brother-in-law had a emergency medicine physician contact yeah. right yeah. So it's like it's asking your primary care doctors it's asking doctors who live in the same areas as you whatever it may be just putting yourself out there and and asking for help, I think sometimes too. Yeah, that's a great piece of advice. Connections and networking is will be your best friend. And thank God the COVID-19 pandemic is at least coming to end. I know we have another COVID wave coming, but I know a lot of Americans are not going to go back to virtual. Um, all universities are still online, but yeah, join some clubs, stick with a club too, that you like commit to that commitment is so important for medical school applications and PAs as well, just to see that you can commit and have a passion for something for a few years or over several months. Yeah. And for research experience as well, this is something that came up on our conference actually if there's any experience that you should do in undergrad it's research because it's very difficult to find research experience after you graduate so take advantage of that while you're in college if you need clinical experience there is time for that if you want to take a few gap years which highly recommend (laughs) take a couple gap years and it's okay to take your time with the medical school application process that's another piece of advice i've give and Yeah, get involved with organizations. I'm going to plug real quick. We do actually have a new team application open um, that's going to close the next week or so. We have several social media positions for the National Pre-Health Community, LinkedIn, Instagram. Sarah really wants you. (laughs) I do. It's true. I need some creative pre-meds. I know (laughs) we seem to be rare though. We're struggling to find. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Come on, guys. All right, brain. Yeah, yeah, we step out of the science. Let's do a little art, artsy, artsy stuff. <laughs> but yeah. I do want to add to what you were saying, Lexi, in regards to research. This is like one of my soapboxes. Definitely try to do research in undergrad. But if you realize you don't like it, please quit. Yep. Don't keep doing it. I yep. don't have any research oh experience God. whatsoever. You know what I've got? Actually, that's not true. I've worked in a lab for three months and I realized I hated it and I didn't want to do this ever again. And I quit and I joined like six other things. <laughs> and yeah. I do not think that makes me a bad applicant because if someone asked me in an interview about my research, I would not be able to tell them it was great. I truly wouldn't. Maybe if you're like a really great actress or something, you can, but please don't waste your time on something you don't enjoy. No, I get that. I I get that. Like, I love research and starting this national research project. A lot of people said to me, well, this isn't a competitive research experience for your application, right? You need to be doing bench, bench top research, research where you're getting published in all these, in all these (laughs) journals. I'm like, I would be washing beakers, right? Like I wouldn't be doing the research. This is research that is impacting students. Students are learning how to put posters together. Students are learning how to ask the right questions, you know, how to use Excel, right? Like they're actually doing the project themselves. They're advocating for themselves. So to me, that's a better project than anyone I would have got in a, in a lab or looking at rats kind of thing. Right. So yeah, even if research in the lab, isn't your thing, maybe something else is, right? And explore that. I always say take your first two years to try everything, see what you like and don't like, and then spend the next two in the ones you like. Oh yeah, I did exactly that. (laughs) I actually did bench lab research and I really enjoyed it, but half of the time I was washing my experiments, like washing the dishes of my experiments, which took as much as the time as conducting the experiments. So it definitely had some patience and it wasn't my favorite as scribing the ER, but also there are different 
very different types of research opportunities that are just as important as bench lab research. Yeah. And absolutely. I, I think, mean, if you do yeah. bench lab research and you realize you don't like it, like I did, the best next step for me was I turned to the psychology department and I said, what kind of research are you <laughs> yeah. guys doing? And that was the best choice for me because I ended up getting to do like a psychology clinical hundred hour practicum studying kids. And it helped me realize that I could be really happy in pediatrics too. So definitely if you don't like bench work, that's not the entire world of research. There's more to it than that. 100%. I love that. Yeah. Oh, research. And it's okay. I think something as well, a lot for a lot of competitive pre-meds is there's a lot of pressure to get published. Oftentimes getting published just comes down to luck Mm -hmm. because your PI might not even have the capacity or be in the right time frame to put out a paper right now, or you're meant, or you're on the wrong project to put out a paper. In my lab, actually, I think halfway through my project, that I was working on, I had switched projects and I got lucky when I switched the projects, there there was an opportunity to contribute to a manuscript. But like, if I had not switched projects, there probably wouldn't have been an opportunity. So things like that, that happens and it's okay to not be published, you know, like take that pressure off too. 100%. And publications don't have to come in the form of medical journal publications. That's true, yeah. Writing writing letters to the editor for the newspaper advocating about something, you know, blog posts, uh, magazine articles, those are all things that undergrads can be doing, sharing the work that they're doing. And there's a lot of people who want to talk about the work that young students, young physicians are are doing, right? So it's definitely a really cool opportunity to do any kind of writing form if you can. It doesn't have to be a med journal. It doesn't have to be JAMA, right? It could it could be some little online platform that you've still learned the value of sharing your data with. Yeah, I know just off the top of my head, the new fit. Ph- is it the new physician? Is that what I'm yep. saying? Yeah. Andres Diaz, a previous Andres guest. Andres Diaz. He's always uh, comes up. <laughs> Everyone knows him. Everyone oh, knows know. him. We're a little obsessed with him. I mean, we managed to bring him up in almost every episode. Oh, okay. I know. I, have- I work with him pretty much full time, so I'm not obsessed with him at all. No, I'm just <laughs> A very good friend of mine but that is a perfect opportunity of a publication that yeah. that is specifically for undergrads and med students to be sharing their thoughts values research whatever it may be to the world that you know there's not a lot of opportunity for so if you guys want to write for the new physician we'll also put that in the in the, wow. end there and in the comments because that's also something that you know students can do and that's a publication right yeah. so it's called absolutely. the new physician magazine they also have an app <laughs> yeah. And Andres Diaz actually did a session at our conference that we just had in July. And he talked a lot about the new physician and mm-hmm. how to go about even submitting an article for that. So if that's something you're really interested in, definitely go check out that session because he gave a lot of great information about that and honestly told me steps to it that I didn't realize I needed to take before I even started writing the article. So I would <laughs> highly recommend listening to that session. Yeah. And just to throw that out there too, I mean, I've written for The New Physician. I am published in The New Physician and it was about an article of how to get back into the gym after COVID. So it doesn't have to be this hard hitting science. It doesn't have to be some special case study about a patient you only see once in a million years, right? It can be something about health and wellness that you're really passionate about or, you know, a topic you're really passionate about. So also don't shy away from maybe I don't know enough for this. Yeah, you do, right? You can only try. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I Even with my research lab, I felt so at times because what I was working on was just just so minute and molecular. And I was like, I don't know everything about every protein and system and this bacterium I was studying. And it really took a long time to get over that imposter syndrome. And hmm. I had this experience where I had to write an article about my molecular biology, but for ninth grade students. And honestly, like, humbled me so much, I guess, where it's just like, oh my gosh, all this complex information, how do I teach it to someone at a younger generation or a younger population? And it actually like made me feel great. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm smarter than a ninth grade. It's just going to uh, oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is what the imposter syndrome has brought me. <laughs> and, 
oh and you God. know what? I can't stand the term imposter syndrome. Yeah. Because I once heard a physician speak about it and speak about the fact that, oh, they're just sticking a label on a trauma that they are purposely putting you through, right? Like he, he, he oh. said something along the lines of like, imposter syndrome is a traumatic response to a society going or a group of students going through the society of pursuing medicine and constantly being told that someone else is better constantly being told that this person has done all of these amazing things and you need to be at the top of this percentile and it's a trauma response it's a trauma Hmm. response and I think that imposter syndrome label just it irks me sometimes because I'm just like it's not you it's what the system's doing yeah right but it doesn't have to be you no that's a very interesting perspective I never thought of it that way um I more thought of it in the way where it's like oh I don't deserve to be on this manuscript because I don't know enough about my project. But yeah, you you do know enough about your project or I do. And it's that constant like emotional and logical battle that is pre-meds face. But yeah, I really appreciate you saying that. Trauma response. I have a question, Tyra, because you said earlier, what's the worst that can happen? You just have Mm -hmm. to try. The worst that can happen is you're rejected. So how do you deal with rejection? Yeah, it's not an easy thing, right? I think for anyone, especially us in in the pre-health wanting to go to any kind of graduate program, people who strive to be excellent, to be perfect sometimes. That sense of trying to make sure that you're on top of everything and rejection just kind of, it hits you. And I'm not going to say that it hasn't hurt. We have been rejected from more schools than we have been accepted to for the research project. Some of them have treated us like we're cutting students' heads open. And it's a hard reality to work and do the paperwork and go through IRB systems and then to be told no. And then to be told, you know, like, there's no value. I know. And then, you know, and that rejection is really, really difficult. But at the end of the day, it's worth it because the schools that did say yes, we were able to do so much. Right. And that's just what it's going to be is every day. It's just knocking on doors. It's just trying your best. And that's going to be life. Right, especially for someone who's underrepresented, someone who comes in into life with not as much as some other people have, the only way you're going to put yourself on that same playing field is if you open yourself up to that rejection and cry about it, scream about it, use your family, use your friends. I cry a good majority of the time. I always say my mom always has to pick up all the pieces. Um, (laughs) And that's okay because I'm not giving up, I'm not quitting. We'll cry yeah. about it and we'll find another way or another person who wants to help us. Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things I always say, like in the face of rejection, you realize whether or not you actually want to be doing this. There are so many times where you'll be rejected, yeah. where it's the perfect opportunity to throw in the towel and go get a nine to five. But let me tell you, I do not want a nine to five. This exactly. is all I want. <laughs> exactly. So I'm going to just keep pushing through it. And Honestly, if there's a listener out there who, in the face of rejection, doesn't want to do this anymore, you should probably follow that feeling. Mm -hmm. Validate that feeling, too, and know that you don't have to. Yeah. 100%. I know two two people who actually went through medical school and upon residency application said, nope, this isn't for me. Right? So, yeah, figure it out. Don't you don't. I know a doctor who I wish had thought that and had thrown in the towel. I really (laughs) wish he had. I think he'd be much happier if he hadn't gone through with this. (laughs) Yeah. Medicine, listen, what we do in this passion, this pursuit, right, of of a career and this passion we have, that's why when people are like, oh, you're going into medicine for the money. First of all, I want to do emergency med. So no, not at all. Um, (laughs) But you can't do this for money. You can't do this for lifestyle. You have to do this for passion because oh, yeah. you can't do it for your parents. You can't do it for the status of it because you know what? That's not going to keep getting you up in the morning, especially when you're getting those no's. You have to really want this and love this. And there's a ton of us that are crazy enough to say, yeah, this is where we want to be. And it just has to be that kind of feeling. And if it's not, then there's so many other healthcare fields, right? There's so much you can do in healthcare that's making such a significant difference. So just find your place, shadow other people. You don't just have to shadow doctors, shadow other people in the hospital and figure out what you like. Yeah. PTs, OTs, PAs, MPs. Business administration. Yeah. Administration. Mm -hmm. 
Advocates, Honestly, there's researches. so many things, epidemiology, mm-hmm. public health. Like there's so many different sectors you can go into. You don't have to be a doctor or a PA or a nurse. Mm-hmm. Like there's so much out there. 100%. Yeah. That reminded me, I actually had a conversation this week. Um, I've been interviewing for new roles and I'm thinking of becoming a medical scribe again before I go to medical school. And I met this physician. He was a surgeon. I asked him, I was like, what do you love about your job in our interview? And what he said to me just was awesome. I just like really was like, okay, cool. Because what he said is if I was going to do this for the money or the lifestyle, he literally said those words. He was like, I would have gone into finance or I would have been an accountant or I would have done literally anything else. But every day when I go to work and I have to meet this patient whose family told me that, I gave, let's say this husband and wife, and I gave their husband five years more of life to live. There is nothing else like that, that opportunity in medicine. He was like, it's more of a sense of giving back to the world and existence in the universe. And it was like a really existential conversation I had in this interview. I was like, wow. (laughs) I was like, that's great. That's amazing. But then he went on and on about, which is also the sad part too, about how he's just being, having this huge administrative burden that's taking away from his opportunity to give patient care and how he really just needed a scribe to relieve that off of him so that he can focus on his patients. And like he put into words, he's like, I really need someone like you to just, so I can give life to people. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, what are we doing to our doctors? (laughs) It's, It's crazy. Honestly, that's one of my biggest reasons to advocate for people becoming PAs. You can't do the admin work as a PA. You don't have the ability to take that on. So you're never going to be stuck in a position where you're going to have to take that on. So if you're really interested in doing like something that's going to involve you needing to run a clinic and you don't want to run a clinic, maybe you should be the PA. Yeah. You see, finding what you're good at, finding what you want from life. Yeah. So I know you already touched on this question a little bit, but I think I want to ask it one more time. What can we as current pre-medical students and future doctors thinking big once we're in that higher up role as a physician or PA do to improve the application process? Yeah, this is going to sound so corny, but advocate, right? Uh, There's too many doctors and residents in that that I've, I've worked with, med students that go through medical training and it is hard. It is really hard on you. There is a lot of burden. And by the time they kind of get to that attending physician spot, they've kind of stopped advocating. They've kind of stopped trying in a sense, right? You often hear the, oh, when I was applying and it's like, that's not good enough anymore, right? We cannot keep saying, oh, but this is just how it's been for generations. Because if we were still practicing the way that we had practiced for generations, our patients would be dying at 40, right? So needs to improve the medical pipeline needs to diversify it needs to improve first of all for our own mental health but also just for medicine in general and I think advocating for yourself if you're a pre-med out there who wants to get involved in this research if it's something that you got excited listening to then reach out let's do it let's do something on your campus because we cannot be a generation to sit here and say it's broken it's broken and throw rocks at it from the outside you got to work through it you got to work through it you got to get to the top you got to burn it down. You got to restart it, right? That's the only way it's going to work. You have to understand it before we can say we're going to change it. So just every step of the way, advocate, speak about the issues, figure out if there's an easier or better way to do it, then put the hard work in to do it. And I know that's not fair on us to be fixing everything, but yeah. someone has to do it. Oh, our generation is fixing a lot right now. <laughs> we have to fix so much in this country. And the generation below us will too as well, because there's some mistakes Mm -hmm. our generation is going to make. And that's cool. That's fine. But as long as there's someone willing to say, well, this isn't working the greatest right now, what can work, especially in medicine and right now fighting for your future? Absolutely. I don't think it's an obligation either. If this doesn't inspire you, don't join the team. We don't want you. This is an opportunity. (laughs) This is something you should feel excited and passionate about. This shouldn't feel like a huge task to take on that's a giant burden for your career. 
Like, yeah. This is truly an opportunity. It's an opportunity to make change happen, to build a better pathway for the students that come after you, and to someday be a better teacher, too. 100%. Awesome. Well, I'd love to jump into our game. Awesome. You know, Sarah, yes. Sarah. Yeah. So this is a new game we're kind of starting to implement. I don't know. It might start to be way too frequent. I really enjoy doing it. So <laughs> I <laughs> have excited. prepared, yeah, I've prepared some rapid fire questions for Tyra. So Lexi's just going to sit in the corner. <laughs> I know. Our, she, she's our peanut gallery. She Sarah says I talk too much. This is the point of the episode where I have to not talk anymore. I've literally I was, I never said much. that. Um, <laughs> my, my mother tells me that every morning. So, <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Okay, okay. So here we go. I've got a bunch of questions for you. Just try to answer them. Short, sweet, simple. You know, it. Just keep it fun. So ready? Okay, let's do it. Okay. What's something new that you've learned recently? That there's not an American Swiss jewelry store in America. It's only a South African brand. I thought it was an American brand because it was called American Swiss. Okay. I don't even know what that is. I'm going to have to Google it afterwards. Swiss. It's a jewelry store. And I thought it was an American jewelry store, but it's not. It's a lie. (laughs) That's hilarious. Okay. How often do you wash your lab coat? I think like two or three times in the semester, maybe. Ooh, okay. That's a lot. I think I wash mine like once a year. <laughs> Try once a college. Stop. <laughs> okay, if you could live anywhere, where would you choose to live? Actually, corny here, Tampa, Florida, where I am now. This is my dream. No, why? I immigrate. Okay, yes, yes, we have issues. We have some issues. I get it. I get it. But I immigrated to this country to follow an American dream, and I'm really living it right now. So can't Aww. say I've I've lived in too many other places in America, so I don't know. But uh, my boyfriend would say on an island where there's no other people. So I guess we have to – Tampa's kind of an island. It, yeah, it definitely is. That's what we think of it. I'm from Orlando, so that's how I think of Tampa. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what TV or movie character do you most relate to? Oh, that's a hard one. Can I say Stitch? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen the Stitch memes? I'm probably yes. Stitch. I'm always hungry, tired, or moody. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. No, I feel that on a personal level. Okay, roller coasters or water slides? Uh, roller coasters. What was your first job? I was a karate instructor. I told karate to three-year-olds. Oh, that's so oh. fun. I love that. Okay. Any good podcast recommendations? This one? Oh, Stop it. <laughs> yeah. I also, I also like the pre-made years. The Dr. Ryan. Yeah, Dr. That one's Ray. good too. What's your favorite color? Purple. Do you have any hobbies? Mm, I'm a pre-med. <laughs> no. <laughs> 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 I love puzzles. I really like to do puzzles. Okay. How do you show people that you love them? I'm affectionate. I'm very like lovable. I want to hug you and oh, I'll give you a hug on the other side of the country. You're too far, <laughs> Lexi. <laughs> okay. Are you a dog or a cat person? Neither. Oh, I've never had an animal. I've never had a pet. Oh, but not even I know like I'm a gonna- fish. I had a fish and then okay. I thought the fish lived for a really long time, but I heard my mom was just replacing it when it died. <laughs> What happened to me? That's so, hilarious. I just need to get used to having one, I guess. Probably yeah. a dog person. Probably more of a dog person. You seem like a dog person if you're affectionate and loving. <laughs> yeah, cats aren't nice. Yeah. I mean, some of them are. Most of them aren't, though. Okay. What's one job you would never do, even for a million dollars? Teach in a high school or pro- like a middle school. <laughs> I wouldn't teach middle school kids for anything in the world. Yeah, they're mean. Okay. How long before a big exam do you start studying? I'm one of those people that are really on it. Like I like to study weekly in the semester. So I normally study a good time in advance. Nice. Leg day or arm day? Oh, I love back and biceps. So I'm going to have to say, I'm going to have to say arm day. Dang. I'm the exact opposite. Me and my sister are both like, do we have to? 
<laughs> that combine nice? just makes me feel strong. I don't know. I just feel strong. <laughs> oh, no. I can lift so much more when it's leg day. <laughs> so what is the first thing that comes to your mind when I say this word? MCAT. Stress. <laughs> Sad. What is one word you would use to describe yourself? A fighter. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Okay, pineapple and pizza? Mm, I normally take the pineapple off because I kind of like the sweetness, but I don't like hot fruit. Okay. Interesting. (laughs) So kind of. (laughs) Do you have a motto that you live by? Pursue your passion. I love that one. Passion driven is is just the way I describe myself. Yeah. That comes across. It totally does. I can see it. Do you have an example of something that gives you the ick? <laughs> um, oh, when like men have like dirty fingernails, yeah, that's something I'm like a no go with. That's like my, uh, yeah, or if they're even like long at all, yeah, no, <laughs> Not really long, hard, no, <laughs> ick. Okay, do you speak any other languages? I did 12 years of Afrikaans in high school. And if I spoke to you, yes. But if I spoke to an Afrikaans person, no. I totally know what you mean. I like, (laughs) I passed a fluency test in French. Like I took it for like eight years. I don't know if I could do it anymore, to be honest. Yeah. (laughs) What's one thing that can always make your day better? Food. Okay, Stitch. Um (laughs) How do you deal with stress? Food. I stress eat. <laughs> I do stress eat. That's my bad way to deal with stress. My good way to deal with stress is working out. Yeah. I have to work out because I eat so much. That's relatable. Okay. What's one thing you've been procrastinating lately? MCAT studying. Actually starting. I'm not starting my full-time prep, but I've started trying to do the MCAT questions of the days. And oh, yeah. uh yeah, I think I haven't done this whole week and I've decided Sunday I'll just do seven. <laughs> Me? <laughs> when I'm studying. Oh my gosh. What song would you sing at karaoke night? Oh, I don't know. Die for Me by the Weekend. Yes. That's a great karaoke song. That's mine and my boyfriend's song. That's, that's why. I'm not Probably why that's the only awesome. reason I would get up there to sing in front of him would be. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Who is the most influential person in your life? My mother. Aww. My mother's my best friend. That's mine awesome. is mine. I totally relate to that. What did you want to be when you grew up as a child? At one stage, I wanted to be a forensic investigator because I loved like Scooby-Doo and, and CSI. Uh, oh so God. forensics. And then when I actually learned what that was, I was like, no. And then ever since I was about 15, 14, it was medicine. Hey, basically the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Either way, bodies, science, medicine, sex. <laughs> what is your biggest fear? I hate to say it, but I think it's failure. I think it's letting yeah. myself down. I think it's not pursuing my passions. You know, I think I'm oftentimes caught in that trap of what if I don't do it? So I think fear. I think I'm, I'm scared of failing. Relatable. Yeah. I don't think you're going to fail. You're awesome. Thank you. (laughs) Do you have any pet peeves? So many. My biggest one in America is when people stop before they turn, right? So like if we're driving on the road and they stop, like dead stop and then turn, I'm like, you can go with the physics. You can go with the motion. But that's what they teach you in our licensing in Florida. It is. You have to stop. Like you treat it like a stop sign and then you turn right. It's a rule. This explains so much. Yeah. <laughs> you know? it, it's a rule. <laughs> it's a rule. Yeah. I had My to. My driver's test was like five minutes. minutes. My driver's test was like five minutes. When did they teach you these things? I, I don't know. In high school, like in my driver's ed class. Yeah. Well, that explains it. I still don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. That. Okay. Last question for you. What is your favorite American food? Oh, chocolate chip cookies. Oh, yeah. I feel like that's a staple American thing. It's so I would have to say chocolate chip cookies. 
or yep. a sugary food. <laughs> we invented this. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Well, awesome. that was my last question. You did great. I loved getting to know more about you. And again, just thank you so much for joining us on this episode. We were so happy we were able to talk with you about all of this. And we can't wait to watch your research project continue to grow and expand. And just honestly, I'm excited to follow along with it. Yeah. And let us know if there's anything we can do to help um, the national pre op community. We love spreading the word for, with stuff like this that truly helps students. So our mission is just to help students at little cost as possible. And having great pre advisors that we pay for already at college would be a great step. <laughs> 100%. 100%. Yeah, if any listeners out there and you want to get involved, just let me know. You can reach out anytime. Yeah. How can they reach out? Do you have any contact information? Yeah, so Instagram works if you want to do that, premed underscore tiger, T-Y-G-A. If you want to do that, premed underscore tiger. Or email, you can do tyra-d.brett at amsa, A-M-S-A, dot com, dot org. AMSA, dot org. Something like that. Search AMSA. <laughs> <laughs> On the AMSA website, my email is there. I think it's org. Awesome. Well, you are so impressive. I can't believe you have represented two world championships that's kind of amazing (laughs) definitely one of the coolest people we've had on the podcast so thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and all of your amazing accomplishments so far we can't wait to see where your project and pre-med journey goes so keep in touch with us thank you so much thank you so much everyone and uh, style world championships is a lot easier than being a pre-med i would say (laughs) (laughs) oh my god (laughs) all right Uh This podcast was produced by Ari Rosenthal, Lorelai Edmonds, and Aditi Galande. You can find our conference on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at National Pre-Health Community or MPHC 2020. You can also find our podcast at Instagram at pre Pod. You can find all of our events at nationalprehealthconfconf.org. And please like, leave a review, or tell one friend if you liked our pod. And don't forget, we have a new team application right now for some social media positions and a couple of other things. But if there's something you're really passionate about that you'd like to help pre health students with, we're pretty open to any ideas with our nonprofit, the National pre health Community. So check that out at our website. Again, nationalprehealthconfconf.org. The current deadline is due September 15th of 2023. Thank you so much for listening. See you later.